Okay, so for connective tissue, um, one of the things that we had talked about before was that connective tissue is going to contain um, within it, it's always going to have a particular type of ground substance, which is kind of the unstructured um, um, substances that are in between the cells and, and the fibers. We're going to have the specific fibers that are part of connective tissue. So with that, we're talking collagen fibers, elastin fibers, or reticular fibers. Um, so different types of connective tissue are going to have different, you know, relative concentrations of elastin to collagen, maybe. So if it has to be a stretchier tissue, it's going to have a higher elastin component um, of its fiber type um, and a um, decreased amount of collagen fibers. Whereas if it's a connective tissue that's really, really strong and it has to withstand a lot of tensile stress, it's going to have a higher collagen content than elastin. So the type of connective tissue certainly plays a role um, in that. And then connective tissue is also going to um, contain different cell types. And so this is where we get into our resident cell types. Uh, we talked about this a few slides ago. So these are going to be either fibroblasts, um, which is going to be the resident cell type that we see in um, connective tissue proper. So that's going to be fibroblasts and then fibrocytes would be the mature form of that cell. Cartilage, we know anything cartilage is going to be chondro. So these guys are going to be chondroblasts um, and that's going to be the resident cell type of cartilage. And then bone tissue, again we know that any um, type of bone tissue is going to be osteo. So these guys are going to be osteoblasts. And again, these are the immature form of the cell, um, and they're going to be actively laying down that type of connective tissue. Um, once they mature, they're going to become fibrocytes, chondrocytes, or osteocytes. Okay, so let's run through um, some specific connective tissues. So the first one um, that we're going to talk about, this is going to be in the, under the category of connective tissue proper. And we can take connective tissue proper and divide it up. Um, it can be either loose, which gives you an idea of kind of how it's arranged. This is a little more loosely arranged, or it can be dense. Okay, and so we've got a couple different types um, of each type of connective tissue. So let's look at um, this is connective tissue proper. This is going to be loose connective tissue, and this is our first type. This is adipose tissue. This is basically fat. Okay, this is um, adipose fat, and what you're going to see is um, adipose cells that are embedded within this um, type of connective tissue, and so these are large, um, round cells that are um, filled with fat, and um, what you see with this too is that the matrix, its, it's extracellular matrix is kind of very, it's described as sparse, like it's not highly organized just because fat um, isn't highly organized and it's got adipocytes which are are going to be your fat cells um, embedded within it. So um, adipose tissue serves as um, a reserve of energy and it also helps protect organs, it protects us against heat loss, that sort of thing. So where you're going to find this is going to be under your subcutaneous tissue, so like under your skin, um, if you peel away the first layer of skin, underneath it you're going to see this layer of um, adipose tissue underneath. We've got adipose tissue. One of the major sites is behind your eyeballs. It's kind of a, um, an interesting place for fat um, all through your abdominal cavity. Um, so all of those places are going to be storage sites for adipose tissue. Um, connective tissue proper. Next one. This is still under the category of loose. This is going to be areolar um, adipose tissue. And so this is basically a gel-like matrix, and it actually has all three fiber types um, contained with it, so or contained in it. It's got collagen fibers, 
um, you know, we've got collagen fibers, we've got elastin fibers, and there are actually um, reticular fibers as well. Um, its cell types are going to be fibroblasts, uh, um, and then also macrophage, macrophages, um, mast cells, and some white blood cells as well embedded in there. So what its function is, is basically to cushion organs. So you'll find areolar tissue kind of wrapping organs like a present, um, and it helps to um, kind of um, um, insulate them. And also, because it's got kind of this loose, um, more gel-like matrix with these fibers, um, it's going to have macrophages that are kind of embedded within that, kind of holding on to that scaffolding. And they're able to take care of any bacteria um, that happens to come into that area. Okay, so we're going to see this around organs. Um, you're going to see this under the um, layer of epithelium um, throughout the body. So that's areolar tissue. Okay, next one. This is also connective tissue proper. Again, loose connective tissue, and the specific type is reticular. Um, so reticular should kind of remind you of reticular fibers, and that's exactly what we see here. So this is basically a loose network. Again, it's loose connective tissue. So here's our loose network of reticular fibers. Again, it's in a gel-like ground substance, so it's not highly structured. Um, but basically, we know that reticular fibers, their function is to form kind of a scaffolding for other cells to, um, to provide structure for other cells, and that's what we see here. So um, its function is its fibers form kind of an internal skeleton or scaffolding for other cells to attach to. So we're going to see this in our lymphoid organs. This is going to be specific to lymphoid organs like your lymph nodes um, in various parts of your body, um, within your bone marrow, and your spleen. And it basically provides support for um, cells associated with lymphoid organs like white blood cells and macrophages. Okay, so now we're heading on. This is our next um, kind of um, subset of connective tissue proper. Now we're on to dense connective tissue, and this is going to be dense regular connective tissue. And so by regular, what we mean is that we have these collagen fibers. This has increased collagen content, and so that should tell you right there, like this is going to be um, found in locations that need to withstand a high amount of tensile stress. Stress, So a lot of tension, so a lot of pulling on these types of tissues. And so where we're going to see that is going to be um, ligaments, ligaments and tendons. So what's the difference there? A ligament is going to attach bone to bone. So maybe if I have the end of a bone here and another bone that um, needs to attach and form a joint there, we're going to have ligaments that are going to go from bone to bone to help support that joint. And that ligament is formed um, from dense regular connective tissue. We also have tendons, and tendons are going to be dense regular connective tissue that attach um, muscle. So maybe here's my tendon, and it's attaching to my big biceps muscle because I've been working out um, while we've been home, and this has been this is attaching to a bone. I didn't draw this all that great, but that's a bone. Here's a tendon, and here's a muscle. Okay, so basically, tendons are attaching muscle to bone, and um, they need to be really strong because that muscle is going to contract and it's going to generate all this force, and it's going to pull um, on the bone and get the bone to move. And we need that tendon to be able to support that. Um, stress. It's got to be able to withstand that tensile stress, and that is really important. So um, what we see with dense regular connective tissue is that these collagen fibers are kind of highly organized, like they're really parallel. You can kind of see them here. They, they look pretty organized there, you know. They're kind of linear, um, and that's what we see there. So it's going to be primarily... Um, uh, parallel collagen fibers because of all that stress. There are going to be a few elastic fibers thrown in 
um, but generally tendons and ligaments are not stretchy. Um, you don't stretch those guys out. And the major cell type, because this is connective tissue proper, we know that the major cell type is going to be fibroblast. Okay, so that's what um, dense regular tissue looks like. Here's some, I pulled this out. Um, these are tendons, you know, in the hand, um, long, long tendons going all the way to the fingers. So connecting muscles of the forearm all the way to the fingers, and they help us move. Okay, um, our next type of connective tissue proper is going to be, um, this is dense connective tissue, and this is going to be dense irregular connective tissue. So if dense regular connective tissue was, you know, these parallel fibers of collagen, what would you think that dense irregular connective tissue would look like? So irregular. So its pattern of collagen fibers is going to be crazy. They're going to be going all these different directions. And so what ends up happening is that because of those collagen fibers and they're arranged all these crazy ways, um, it's going to be able to withstand tensile stress in any direction. So not just pulling like in one direction like a tendon. Um, it's going to be really, really, um, you know, tight and not stretchy in all directions. Okay. So that's what we see here um, with dense irregular connective tissue. So the main location for this is going to be fibrous capsules of organs. So it's going to either cover the organ and help protect it like the kidneys um, or joints. And so we see here, your, this is a shoulder joint and your shoulder joint and, and every synovial joint in your body is going to have a capsule that covers it. And this is an um, extremely close up um, picture of your shoulder joint. It's basically the same thing, but here they've kind of cut, they've made a cut through the, um, through the capsule here so you can see it. This is like the joint cavity of your shoulder here, but this tissue all through here is the dense irregular connective tissue that makes up the um, capsule of the shoulder. And what it does is that it basically adds stability to that joint because synovial joints are super mobile. They can move in all these different directions. Um, and so they need some stability. So that um, capsule helps provide that for them. Um, so what we see with um, dense irregular connective tissue is irregularly arranged collagen fibers. Um, like we said, you know, it goes in all these different directions. We have a few elastic fibers, um, but it's not, not a large component of it. And then because it's connective tissue, our fibroblast is going to be the major um, cell type there. I do want to point out one more thing. I'm going to back up. I do want to point this out. I didn't mean to skip this. Um, aponeurosis. Um, aponeurosis is um, a, a type of dense regular connective tissue structure that we see in the body. And this is basically, um, it's a tendon, but it's a broad flat tendon. And so we see aponeuroses in a couple places in the body. And one of the most identifiable one is your IT band um, on the outside of your thigh. So if any of you guys are like runners, um, you've probably had some dealings with your IT band or your iliotibial band. Um, so, you know, it can be the bane of many runners. But one of the things I'd like to point out is, um, you know, dense, dense regular connective tissue, again, it's mostly collagen. And collagen doesn't stretch. Um, it's got very few elastic fibers. And so when people talk about stretching your IT band, well, that should kind of bring to mind, okay, well, what kind of tissue type is that? And is that tissue type stretchy? And it's really not, you know, it, it doesn't really stretch. And so um, you don't stretch out your IT band, you stretch out the muscles that attach to your IT band. And that helps to kind of loosen up um, the IT band and its attachments. But that's something, you know, we usually spend some time looking at that in cadaver lab. That's always interesting to students because um, that hits home. A lot of people have had issues with IT band. Okay, dense irregular. Um, and then now we're on to cartilage. So this is our next connective tissue type. So cartilage is pretty tough. Um, we find cartilage in a lot of different locations in the body. It's usually in um, areas that need to absorb um, shock. 
And so that's why cartilage is going to contain large amounts of the glycosaminoglycan called hyaluronic acid. And basically this holds on to water. Um, so cartilage is up to 80% water and that helps it absorb compression, which is a good thing. Um, cartilage is interesting. It is not innervated. So it lacks nerve fibers. It is not innervated. So you can't feel pain from cartilage. And it's avascular. So if you recall what avascular means, it doesn't have a blood supply. So cartilage, it, it doesn't have nerves and it doesn't have a blood supply. Um, so that should be thinking in your head like, hmm, wonder, wonder how that regenerates, right? Well, in a lot of cases, not so great. So we'll talk about that. Um, so um, the resident cell type in cartilage is going to be chondroblasts. And what we see is that chondroblasts are active, producing new cartilage basically up until adolescence. So, you know, kind of late teens, um, we see new cartilage being made. And then those chondroblasts um, become chondrocytes. They become the mature, um, you know, resident cell. And basically what we see is after a point in time, they don't revert back. So if you're, you know, like 45 and you tear up the cartilage in your knee playing basketball, you are not going to regrow new cartilage. So your chondrocytes are done. They are not regenerating new cartilage and you're probably going to just have to, you know, sit on it or have surgery maybe depending on what's going on. So um, cartilage past a certain point is not regenerative. Um, here's our types of cartilage. We've got three types of cartilage that are important. So the first one is hyaline cartilage. And this is basically um, a pretty firm extracellular matrix with collagen fibers um, embedded in it. And then we know chondroblasts are going to be our mature um, or our immature version of that resident cell type, and they're ultimately going to become chondrocytes when they mature. So where we see um, hyaline cartilage is basically um, the embryonic skeleton, so babies before they're born, um, their skeleton is made entirely of cartilage, and then as they're growing um, as a fetus before birth, that cartilage gets replaced by bone um, and and then they're born and then those bones continue to grow but in the very beginning the whole skeleton is actually a cartilage it creates like a kind of a um, template for the bone to grow in um, hyaline cartilage also covers the ends of long bones and I bring this up here this is actually chicken so if you've ever eaten like a chicken leg or a chicken wing and you break it open and you see the end of the bone, that white shiny stuff, that is hyaline cartilage. And we actually have the same thing. This is a human knee um, here. And what we've done, this is the femur, uh, this is tibia here, this is like your um, leg bone, this is thigh bone. And we've taken the patellar tendon on the front and kind of just reflected it down so we can see inside the knee joint. Here's your um, ACL and PCL. Anyway, here's um, white, you know, right lining this joint surface is going to be hyaline cartilage. Okay, so it basically lines the joint surfaces um, or covers the joint surfaces, um, costal cartilages of the rib cage. So all of these cartilages are going to be um, hyaline cartilage. So basically, um, one of its main, fun main functions is to resist compression. So as you're, you know, running on your knee and you're pounding down every time you take a step, that cartilage in your knee joint is, re is absorbing compression so that you're not damaging the bone um, underneath it. Okay, and so here's a question here. You know, what do we know functionally and structurally about cartilage? We know that it's avascular, so it doesn't have a blood supply. We know that it's not innervated. So when you have patients who come into you and they've worn down cartilage in their knee and they're like, oh, my knee is killing me, is it the cartilage that's causing them pain? So if cartilage is not innervated, 
why do patients complain of pain? Well, they complain of pain because if you look at this, this is an arthroscopy view of the knee, and um, you can see this normal articular cartilage here. It's nice and white and smooth. It looks, it looks really nice. And then you can see here this kind of edge where it's starting to break down through this area. Okay, well, that's fine. That cartilage is not innervated. It's not causing anybody any pain. But once that patient has worn down their cartilage so that they're down to bone, now it's painful. And the reason for that is because bone is highly innervated. It has lots and lots of nerves. Cartilage has no nerves. Um, but once that patient has worn down to the bone, now it's painful. Um, so when you have a patient who comes in and says, you know, the cartilage is torn and it's hurting or the, you know, I've worn the cartilage down and it hurts. Well, at that point, they've worn down cartilage to the point where now they're, now they're on bone. And yes, bone is very painful. So that's what that is. Okay, elastic cartilage. That's our next type of cartilage. Um, elastic cartilage is kind of what it sounds like. It's going to have a higher um, concentration of elastic fibers. So we know it's going to be kind of bendy because of those um, elastin fibers. Um, so its function is to maintain shape while allowing some flexibility. So we're going to see this. Um, your external ear is elastic cartilage, and then also to your epiglottis, which is this little flap um, that routes food down your esophagus and not down your trachea. So um, hot dogs that you eat don't end up in your lungs because that's never good. Um, but epiglottis is a little flap of tissue, and that's made out of elastic cartilage too. So basically we have two locations in the body where we see elastic cartilage. And then our last type of cartilage is fibrocartilage. Um, so fibrocartilage is a little less firm than hyaline cartilage, um, but it is primarily collagen fibers, and so we've got a lot of absorption of compression here. So when you look at where you see these, it makes sense. So one of the main locations for fibrocartilage are intervertebral discs. So the discs, the little cushions in between your vertebrae of your spine, you can see them here and here, right? These are fibrocartilage. And so basically you've got all this compression, you know, traveling down this way through your spine all day long. Um, and those discs need to be able to absorb that compression. We also see, this is actually a cross-section of a disc. This is an intervertebral disc. If we take it out and we kind of look at it from the top, and then here's degeneration. You know, that one doesn't look nearly as healthy as this one does. Um, but this is what degenerative disc disease looks like. Um, we also see fibrocartilage in the pubic symphysis, which is the um, joint formed by the pelvis in the front. Um, and then discs in the knee. So if you've heard of meniscus, um, those are cushions um, in the knee joint that are um, formed by fibrocartilage. So again, that, that tells you there, um, you know, that they need that compression, ability to, to absorb compression um, in the knee joint. Okay, and now we're on to bone. So our next connective tissue is gonna be bone. Um, and what we have here is basically bone is pretty similar to cartilage, but it's a lot harder, okay? So what we've done with bone is that with the matrix, we have added in inorganic calcium salts. And so this basically creates a level of hardness in bone that we don't see in other connective tissues because of those um, calcium salts. Bone is highly vascularized. It has a rich blood supply. And the way that bone is, um, is arranged is that we have um, osteons. It's basically like these circles. They look like tree rings, basically. It's basically these concentric um, circles and um, in, in those osteons, we have osteoblasts that are going to be the immature bone cell, and they're actively laying down bony tissue. And then once they're finished, once they're kind of surrounded by bone, they kind of just shut off. 
and they become osteocytes. And so they're just at that point, like the boss cells and they're going to tell other cells to lay down bony tissue because they're kind of done with their part of it. Um, but bone, you know, it's arranged in these osteons, these concentric um, circles of tissue, and it creates a lot of strength. Um, bone is very supportive. It's very protective. Think about your skull um, protecting your brain. Um, but some areas of bone have a lot of spaces um, in them, and so we see storage of fat. We see um, blood cell formation located in bone. So a lot of stuff is, is happening in the bone. So here's, yep, here's our bone. Um, another name for bone would be osseous tissue. Um, so it's basically very hard calcified matrix. Um, it does have a lot of collagen fibers because it's able to withstand um, a lot of stress. And then it's highly vascularized. It's also highly innervated. So um, bone hurts. If you've ever broken a bone, you know that bones hurt. If you've ever had shin splints, you know bones hurt. So they obviously have nerves going to them. Um, and if you break a bone, it bleeds. So we certainly see that bones are, bones are vascular and innervated. Um, and so this is showing you here, you can see kind of the tree rings formation, but we'll get into a little bit more of that um, kind of our next topic when we do actually bones and skeletal system. Okay, and then our last um, connective tissue is going to be blood. And this is kind of our um, connective tissue that's a little less typical. So you don't really think of blood as being a connective tissue, but it is because all connective tissue arises from mesenchyme and blood does the same thing. So basically the resident cell types in um, blood are going to be your blood cells and it's got a fluid matrix which is kind of unusual there um, most of the other matrices that we talked about were gel or like with bone we've got a hard matrix that's got those inorganic um, salts embedded in it to give it strength but the um, fluid matrix of blood is called plasma and so that's the fluid part of the blood that the blood cells are um, are carried in. Blood is more of a transport type of connective tissue, so it's going to carry nutrients from our digestive system, it's going to carry respiratory gases from our lungs, um, and then also waste products um, to the kidneys so that we can get rid of it. And so this is what it looks like here. Um, the fluid matrix is going to be all of this part in between the cells. Here's a red blood cell, they look like little donuts. Um, and then these are examples of white blood cells. They are the huge cells within your blood. Um, and then we would typically have little platelets, you know, that are kind of embedded in there as well. Okay. And then um, muscle tissue. So um, this is our next type of tissue. So we've, we've talked about epithelial tissue. We've talked about um, connective tissue, and now we're into muscle tissue. So this is our third type of tissue. So muscle tissue is highly vascular. It's got a great blood supply, um, which you know if you ever um, strain a muscle and it bleeds, um, or you get a bruise because you get hit with a baseball, um, muscle bleeds and it's highly vascular. We've got three types of um, muscle tissue. The first type is going to be skeletal muscle. And these guys are going to be huge skeletal muscle cells. They're going to attach to our um, skeleton, hence the name skeletal muscle. And um, these guys have striations um, in them because of the uh, myofilaments that they contain. That's skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle is specifically found in the heart. And um, when it contracts, it's going to create beating of the heart. Um, it does have specialized junctions called intercalated discs that we'll talk about a little bit more when we do, um, or a lot more when we do cardiac um, or cardiovascular anatomy. And then smooth muscle. So smooth muscle is found um, within the walls of hollow organs. So like here's a cross section of the stomach. 
So the stomach would have a layer of smooth muscle, you know, kind of embedded um, within it all throughout the GI tract, um, all throughout the um, kidneys. So um, basically any, you know, internal organs are going to have a layer of smooth muscle inside them. And so what we see, let me just back up here, um, skeletal muscle is going to be the only muscle type that's voluntary, meaning that you have control over it. You tell your muscles when to contract. Um, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle are both going to be involuntary. You don't have to tell your heart to contract 70 times a minute. It just takes care of that for you. And also you don't have to tell your um, digestive tract to move the food along um, because it just takes care of that for you too. But those are our three types of muscle tissue. And then our fourth type of tissue in the body is going to be nervous tissue. And so this is basically brain and spinal cord and nerves. Um, and we're going to get a lot more into this at the end of, um, of uh, this semester. Um, basically what we see with nervous tissue is we've got two types of cells within um, nervous tissue. We've got neurons which are these like really um, kind of delicate, you know, um, cells with these long kind of processes sticking out of them. Um, they are going to help us detect stimuli and they're highly excitable and they operate really quickly. So they help transmit electrical impulses um, to help us um, receive stimuli from our environment and from our body and then to um, create a change or to have an effect um, or stimulate an effect based on that um, input. And then neurons need a lot of support because again they're, they're very fragile and they've got these long processes that kind of stick around. Um, so we've got supporting cells and we call those either glia or neuroglia um, and so those are kind of the support staff of the neurons. And so this is basically what it looks like, but you can see these long, um, you know, this would be the cell body of the neuron with these long processes kind of sticking out that are going to make connections to um, other neurons. Okay, um, tissue repair. So, you know, in the, this is basically talking about the process of tissue repair, and we see three stages of tissue repair. Um, so the first stage when we have an injury is going to be our body is going to create an inflammatory response. So that trauma is going to release inflammatory chemicals um, within the body, which are going to do several things for us. So one thing is we're going to see um, an increased permeability of blood vessels in that area. So basically blood that was contained within the vessel, that vessel is now going to have increased permeability. So some of that blood is going to leak out of the blood vessel. And so that's why when you injure an area, it becomes swollen because blood has now leaked out of the um, blood vessel into the interstitial fluid. So it's going to become swollen. It's going to become red. It's going to feel hot to touch um, because of all that inflammation. Um, and basically why this happened, this is a good thing, and sometimes you want that infl inflammatory process to happen because white blood cells and those clotting proteins that are circulating through the cardiovascular system are able to leave the leaky blood vessel and travel into the interstitial fluid so that they can then um, have an effect. Um, we are going to have blood clotting through platelets in the blood, um, in the blood that are going to seal off the injured area to reduce blood loss. And then the surface of the clot is going to dry and form a scab. So this is basically what happens um, as that blood clot kind of progresses, you're gonna see it kind of seal um, everything off at the top, okay? Second phase of tissue repair is gonna be the formation of granulation tissue. Okay. And this is what happens when we have regrowth of capillaries um, into the injured area. So this is going to be bright red tissue. And, and I used to do wound care 
um, in my practice and um, patients would see, let me, I'm just going to go ahead. People would see this type of tissue. Okay. Obviously this is a pretty significant injury, but you can see that bright red tissue underneath. That's the best looking tissue ever. Even here, nice bright red tissue. You can see some yellow kind of embedded in it and that's okay. I'm sure the body's working hard to get rid of that to make it all look nice um, and red like that. That nice healthy granulation tissue, that's a good sign. Okay, that's a good thing. Um, under um, tissue repair, we're gonna have um, macrophages, oops, oops hold on, um, that are going to um, travel into the area and they're gonna help phagocytize um, the dead cells that are in the area and just basically clean everything up. We're going to have fibroblasts that are actively multiplying and um, creating fibers to bridge the injured area. And that's um, basically what we're seeing here is we're going to see this um, proliferation of fibroblasts and they're basically going to create these um, fibers that are going to span across the injured area. Here's our initial injury. They're going to span across that injured area and they're going to basically work on pulling the two edges together. Okay, so that's how fibroblasts are going to are going to um, help um, kind of bring the two edges of the injured tissue together. And then what we're going to see is the epithelial cells on the top are going to um, multiply. So here on the top, we know that epithelial tissue is highly regenerative. And so those guys are going to be actively um, uh, multiplying to cover the, um, or to basically help heal the epithelium. In our third stage, we've got regeneration and fibrosis. And so basically we've got the fibrous area contracts, pulling the edges of the wound together. And that relates back to the um, fibroblasts um, creating those, um, um, the uh, fibers that are going to bridge the two edges of the injured part together. And so that's what we see here. This is kind of our fibrosed um, area here where we've um, pulled the edges together. We're going to have a thickening of our epithelium in the area of, um, of the injury. And then um, the scab is eventually going to fall off when it's ready, when the epithelium underneath the scab um, is completely ready. So here's a, a nice scab and you can even see kind of the pulling or the tension that's been generated by those fibroblasts when the skin underneath is um, fully covering the injured area, then that scab is eventually going to fall off. So don't pick your scabs because you'll make them fall off earlier and then your body just has to work even harder um, to heal. So when it's um, finished, the epithelium is going to be fully regenerated. It's going to cover any kind of opening. And then we're basically going to have a little bit of scar tissue underneath, which is what, what you see here. And there's your granulation. Okay.